Our next speaker is the founder of App Camp for Girls. Uh, she's previously responsible for marketing at Smile. She volunteers at Rock and Roll Camp for Girls uh, in Portland, and she plays guitar for Ruby Calling. Jean McDonald. How's everybody doing today? Still awake? Day four? <laughs> um, I'm Jean McDonald, um, and uh, today I want to talk about this subject, which is really near and dear to my heart. Uh, communicating across the geek divide, that's a pretty, uh, pretty broad topic. I'm going to just focus on a few things um, today um, about it, but um, you know, it can apply to a myriad of contexts, and when I get to the end, I think I'll talk a little bit about a broader thing beyond the geek divide and just the divide in general. Um, this morning when I was procrastinating and preparing for this talk, uh, I watched Mike Lee's talk from Tuesday, and I was just so blown away. If you haven't watched it, I'm sorry I couldn't be here when he gave it. Um, anyway, that, uh, that notion of, of trying to break down the barriers between uh, people who you've, you see as other than you, I think that's, a, that's probably one of the most important themes of this alt-conf, um, and I'm really, really happy to have been part of it. Um, <clears throat> So uh, most of my professional life, I have been in this like cusp of the geek divide. So in uh, 2001, I participated in this fantastic program called Geek Corps. It's kind of a Peace Corps for geeks. And um, I taught web design in Ghana. Um, I lived in a house with the seven other members of Geek Corps, all guys, um, all programmers. And man, some of those dinnertime discussions, I definitely felt like, well, everybody's speaking a language that I don't understand, but it was cool. And uh, I learned a lot um, getting to know those guys and to be able to, you know, to, to communicate with them. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And um, unfortunately, the program doesn't really exist anymore like, as it did in its original form. I would be telling everybody, go sign up for it because it was awesome. Um, uh, after that, I was also a uh, web design instructor at the Pacific Northwest College of Art. And on that side, I was the geek telling the students, most of my students were print designers, and they were like moving into this scary world of digital uh, media, and I insisted that they had to learn HTML and uh, JavaScript uh, to be competent designers in this field, and um, definitely learning how to communicate that and make them excited about it, that was a good experience as well. Um, Smile, of course, I think a lot of you are familiar with them, and my uh, uh, partners, my um, erstwhile partners, they were um, Philip and Greg. They're just incredible programmers and decades of experience. And I learned a lot um, with them, working together with them to help bridge that divide between smile, very geeky people, to customers who want to use PDF Pen and Text Expander who don't, you don't need to be a geek to, to use or to want to use those programs. And finally, App Camp for Girls, that's another divide. Not really going to talk about that today. I think we've uh, We've um, had a lot on that subject um, yesterday from Brianna, which was awesome. And um, so let me just get down to it. What I'm going to argue today is that the traits that make you a brilliant programmer are also the traits that could hinder you from being a brilliant communicator as well. Um, and yes, I, <laughs> um, in fact, that, that not equal sign there is a text expander snippet. And we had a little bit of a conflict on what would be the uh, abbreviation for that snippet, because I just wanted to make it slash equal sign. And the guys were like, this is screwing us up. <laughs> we need to make extra equal, equal signs in the abbreviation. But anyway, another story, another geek divide story. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about that I think um, is very important for programming, um, you can't write code without it. It's precision. Uh, but precision is not necessarily your friend when you're trying to communicate with people who are not geeks. Um, this first came to my attention when one of my really good friends, um, uh, Colleen Wainwright, she's a, a fantastic writer and also she's known as the communicatrix online. And she, um, she's a big text expander user. She's not really a geek. And she was helping me review some of my marketing copy. And she said, um, yeah, look at that first uh, sentence there, which was, Text expander lets users define abbreviations for their most frequently used text strings. And uh, I said, oh, string. <laughs> uh, 
um, she says, you know, uh, the casual user is going to have to stop and think for a bit to figure out if they even know what a text string is. Uh, this has been in my copy for like years, and I consider myself good at weeding out jargon, but uh, it, it hit me like, wow, it's, it's, it's very easy to get in your own space where in your space, this is a string, you know? It's some com combination of characters, numbers, whatever. We know what we, we know um, as geeks, string has a certain meaning to us, but to our potential non-geek users, this is where they're thinking, you know? They, and, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of other kinds of strings that also have technical names, of course, but um, your average uh, user isn't thinking about those either. Um, so what I d ended up doing is I just changed it to text expander. It lets you uh, define abbreviations for your frequently used text, period. Um, text is not a specially precise word. As we know, it could be a little vague. What would that encompass? I mean, that was... When we used the word string in that, that copy, you know, we were trying to be helpful to say, well, it's not just words, it's not just numbers, it could be words and numbers together, it could be your zip code, it could be your email address, you know, it could be lots and lots of lines of text of a support email. Um, because we want to give all that information to people, but if they can't take it in, it's really just going over their head. So most people have an idea of what text is, and that's enough at least to get them started. Um, and I wanted to point you to a really awesome, uh, really short blog post by Brent Simmons that he did a couple months ago um, where he gave a lot of great little tips for programmers to de-geekify their app descriptions. And as he says, use words that humans use, um, no algorithms. And uh, I highly recommend you go um, uh, to inessential.com and um, either you know, just, just search on the word algorithm and you'll find, find this uh, post. It was really good. Um, the next trait that I wanted to uh, talk about is something right now I'm calling comprehensiveness. Um, what, I have really been struggling finding a word that means what I think um, programmers are really good at, thinking through the whole picture, thinking through the big, um, big issues, the little issues, the edge cases, the everything that you need to make that program run, um, to make sure those features uh, work, that's really important to be complete. Um, however, when you're talking about marketing, writing, a, a, say, a, a blurb for your, um, your program that um, does FTP, if you have a bullet like this, and that's your first bullet, then Who's going to really think this pro who, whoever doesn't know what all of those letters mean <laughs> is going to say, hmm, this must be too complicated for me. Um, and uh, in fact, this is the first bullet of a certain uh, program that we all know and love, and it is not too complicated for the non-geek. Uh, you know, but I would say, free tip for those people, and they know who they are, um, <laughs> rewrite the bullet, rewrite the first bullet. So get your files on, from your computer onto the internet quickly and easily. That would, would encourage those uh, non-geek users to think, oh, I, I need that. I could do that, and it's easy, and it's quick. And that is not an, an inaccurate description of what this program does. Um, and maybe take that other bullet and put it last so that the people who care about SSL and SFTP and those sort of things, they'll get there. They'll read all the bullets. But your average uh, non-geek user is going to get stuck at number one. Um, I, uh, in fact, I mean, FTP plays a, a pivotal role in my personal geek divide education. When I first started working um, in, as an internet marketing manager, this is like in 1995, and I was the most qualified person, which means like I had been on the internet like two times. Um, so. We had a website, it was a children's uh, software publishing company that my sister Judy started. Um, we had a website, and uh, it had been built by an outside agency, but I was supposed to maintain it. And I had a lot of great ideas for what we could do on it, but um, my, I had to talk to our, our, our developers who were in charge of putting stuff on the website. You know? And at this time, this was my first really you know, tech, techie type job. I, that made sense to me. Obviously, today, I'm like, are you kidding me? You don't put the programmers in charge of the website. That They'll never have time for it, which is what they told me. They said, here, use this program called Claris Homepage. 
and uh, make the web pages, and then we'll put them up for you. Um, and so I did that, and then I had these files. I said, okay, I'm ready. And they're like, oh, yeah, we can't even look at that for like two weeks. Um, yeah, that FTP is going to have to wait. And I'm like, oh, what is FTP? <laughs> it sounds hard. It, um, anyway, the, uh, I ended up paying this outside agency to FTP my files. They also had an interest in not telling me what FTP was. Um, and they made a couple hundred dollars off of that, which is, you know, was uh, expensive but good education for me. Eventually, I took a web design class myself. The last day of the class, um, it was a, like a three-week course, and we, uh, we uploaded our files, our websites that we created. Um, that was in Fetch at the time, was the, like the, the program everybody used. And uh, the, the instructor said to me, okay, just now grab those and drag them over here. I looked at him, I said, that's it? <laughs> that is FTP? Oh my God. And then, you know, sorry programmers, but I never take you 100% seriously anymore when they say, hey, we can't look at that for even two weeks from now. So um, I, I honestly, I don't blame them. They shouldn't, that shouldn't have been part of their job. And I'm sure they found it very demeaning that it was in their job description. Uh, so yeah, so to get to the last point, it really leads into that, is that let's don't make users feel stupid. Um, it's really easy to do because we do like to be precise. We do like to throw everything in the kitchen sink into a description. Um, people get lost in those descriptions. They get stuck on them. Um, and you can be surprised, like even now, so not that long ago, I'll give another text expander example. Um, uh, one of my favorite things to do at Smile was to um, work on the release notes uh, bullet by bullet with my uh, uh, colleague Greg. Mainly, we would get on iChat, and he would say, here's the bullets. And then I would say, OK, how about rewriting this one so it says this that's a little bit more plain English, right? rewriting stuff. Um, it was fun. We actually we really enjoyed it. And I miss that still um, today, having um, gone full time working at AppCamp. I don't get to, to get to crunch the release notes with Greg anymore. But one um, release, there was a, a bullet point that says, resolves a race condition. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, that's a typo. I, I, and I almost changed it myself to rare, right? I thought it involves a rare, resolves a rare condition, which can cause crashes. Um, but knowing Greg and his uh, you know, legendary attention to detail, I was pretty sure that it wasn't a typo. And I said, what is race? I said, isn't that rare condition? He says, no, it's a, it's a thing. It's called race condition. And I. Uh, said, I have no idea what that is. You know, and now we're talking, like I've been working with them for 10 years, so this has never come up in a bullet before. Um, I said, can we, is there another word we can use? And they're like, mm, race condition is race condition. Um, and I understood that, you know, for sure, but I did some research and I suggested, how about resolves a timing issue, i.e. race condition, which can cause crashes upon expansion on certain systems. So now we have both. Timing issue, I mean, the non-geek doesn't need to understand exactly how that timing issue, I mean, even this is probably a little too geeky, and I will, as I look at it right now, I'm thinking, hmm, that will still be you know, confusing to some people. What's timing, like is it how fast my text expander works? Or, and, you know, but anyway, you, you know, there's always room for improvement. But I think by at least putting some of it in a little bit more plain English, using a, terms that didn't seem completely um, geeky, you know, to me, I, and I, I feel like that was, a, that was a good call. So that's a strategy I highly recommend, is even if you need to put in something that's, that's very technical, see if you can't put, sweeten it a little bit with some kind of language that says, hey, you might not know what this means, but it does not make you stupid. Um, so so that's, those are my, my main points um, about the technical aspect of things. Um, and for the last couple minutes, I just want to talk about a, a broader issue, um, which is, you know, technical or not, like let's not make people feel stupid. Um, this is um, uh, a couple of our awesome volunteers at App Camp for Girls. This is Pace and Kylie Smith. They come every session to talk to the girls about um, how not to get freaked out on the internet uh, with all the kinds of yuck that is out there, how to, to keep yourself from uh, getting depressed or mad or 
whatever. They're very good at that. Um, they are, I bring them up because uh, um, they wrote a book called The Usual Error, um, Why We Don't Understand Each Other and 34 Ways to Make It Better. And I suggest you might want to uh, check out that book. Um, they, uh, essentially, the usual error is this, that you assume that what you know and what your background is is the same that the person you're trying to communicate has. I mean, it's a, it's a unstated assumption. We, we assume more than we really should. Um, and that's where communication errors come into um, uh, play for in all walks of life, all areas of life. Um, in particular, um, I have a pet peeve. I do it myself, and I'm trying to, congr to stop doing it. And I want to challenge everybody today. Um, if you ever say stuff like this, what? You don't know what? blank is when somebody mentions like, you know, they, they see your book about programming or they see your album from some musician they haven't heard of or they see, um, you know, there's a movie that they haven't seen that you've seen. Like, don't make them feel stupid about it. Say, uh, uh, you know, re resist the urge to say, you don't know X and just, you know, go with, hey, let me help you with that. Um, I think I'll make the world a better place, just like that. That's all I have for today. Thank you so much for coming and listening to me. Um, you can um, get to uh, us at appcamp4girls.com um, if you're interested in AppCamp. Um, and uh, I'm on Twitter as MacGenie, uh, G-E-N-I-E. And if uh, anybody has any questions or comments, you know, uh, about what I've talked about here or anything, you know, related. Let's let's do that. Yes. Back there. Thank you for this very important talk. There's one thing that I always go by and I remember the first Macintosh manual ever of the first Macintosh. I don't know if <laughs> you had one of those. Um, I didn't, and it, <laughs> it, this really struck me as an example of good manual writing. Maybe you don't agree, but the first Macintosh had a little switch you could install optionally. And in the manual, it said, this is the programmer switch. It allows you to create an interrupt or a reset. If you don't know what a reset or an interrupt is, you do not need this switch. <laughs> and this is, I, I once had the, um, took responsibility for our manuals at our software company, and I've removed pages of stuff with exactly this thing. It said like, um, and I just made it to, in this field you can enter, say, your ISBN. If you don't know what an ISBN is, you can leave this field empty. Yeah, that's perfect. I mean, the only thing I might want to add to that is like, if, you don't know what an ISBN is, you can leave this field perfectly, but leave this field blank. But um, if you want to know more, link, you know, to, the, to where you get your ISBN numbers, because that, I mean, obviously somebody could Google it and they would get to ISBN, but, you know, people are curious. Um, when I hear like, oh, that's the programmer switch, and if you don't know what this interrupter is, I'd be like, hmm, now I want to find out what that is. Uh, a lot of people will be like, thank God, I don't have to figure that out. But some people will want to know. We Quasi-geeks like myself will, will know just enough to be dangerous. And uh, maybe if you can point us in the right direction um, where we can get the information that will tell us, like, yeah, you could try this, or you should not touch this under any circumstances. <laughs> um, anybody else? Comment? Question? This is Nat Ostom from... App Camp for Girls, so she's uh, our lead developer, so now I'm really on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, it reminded me of something that we talked about last night when you were talking to the, talking to us about the talk. Um, there's this thing on Reddit um, called Explain to Me Like I'm Five, which most of you all probably know about, um, and I just thought it kind of goes pretty well hand in hand with that. Like, I've read Explain to Me Like I'm Five questions about, you know, rocket science and all kinds of things that I really don't know anything about, and uh, when you take that approach of thinking about something like, oh, well, 
if I'm five, how would you explain this to me? Um, it's a good way to like step back and um, think about it in a simple way. Yeah, no, that's right. It was, I, I had meant to throw something into the talk, but of course I was too busy watching Mike Lee's talk. It's thir 38 minutes, but it's really, really worth watching. Um, yes, explain to me like I'm five. Um, assuming like you don't explain to people like they only understand five-year-old language, uh, <laughs> for sure, um, because uh, we obviously, we don't want to talk down to people. Um, there's that whole uh, notion of mansplaining. I know we've heard that tossed around. Women can mansplain, too. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but yes, I haven't read the Reddit thread, so I, I, I can't talk to it uh, from experience, but definitely got to check that out. Anyone else? Yeah. Over there. Um, this is perhaps part of a, a bigger talk or a different topic that maybe leads on from what we're talking about at the moment, but I wonder how much of your work at SMILE was involved in changing the specifics of, um, of how you were already communicating things like release notes and, and your website and how much of it involved finding new ways of, of reaching out to other non-geek users so that they would even end up at your website in, in the first place. Right. Um, yeah, we, I mean, so the question is, did I, how much time was I spending, you know, maybe rewriting or reorganizing um, documentation and website uh, release notes and stuff, and how much trying to get people to read that stuff in the first place, and definitely more of the latter, because that's, if, you know, if we don't get them to read the material, then there's really not much point in spending all our time rewriting it. We might as well just leave it at the, the geek level. Um, and, um, yeah, so I, I mean, it's, it, it, it was a tricky um, uh, proposition, and I don't think I ever really um, felt like I clinched it and said, aha, now we finally got to those, those people who don't normally... Um, consider themselves uh, purchasers of third-party software. I mean, that's, there's many, many Mac users, and probably the majority, that never go out and try to find something to do that they can't already do with the tools that, are, that come with the Mac. Um, we, we tried things like, I mean, we, we, we advertised in Macworld for a while. I mean, that's not an uh, option available it certainly wasn't available to us when we first got started because advertising, that kind of advertising is pricey. But, um, but that, that did help. Be, but even so, the reader of Macworld is already a certain level of uh, um, at least geek interested, if not actually geeky. Um, we, um, we went out to Mac user groups and similar thing. I mean, the Mac user groups, a lot of the members are completely new or relatively new to the platform, and they, um, uh, uh, and it's a great community. I mean, I, I have sensed in, over the years like there's a little bit of a disdain for Mac user groups. Um, it's an old-fashioned concept. You know, young people today don't say like, "Hey, let's all get together in the same physical place and bring our computers and you know figure things out together." But uh, you know, Mac user groups got going before there was an internet, before there were laptops even. <laughs> so. They, uh, um, had, uh, they, they provide a resource for new users. And yes, the, the age group tends to skew older. But don't forget that older people are probably going to buy your software. They don't look to torrent it or you know, crack your, your serial code. So it's, it's, a group, it's a group of people. I mean, I don't expect we'll have Mac user groups at, at the way we do now, you know, maybe 20 years from now. But Right now, there's still a viable option for reaching people who, um, who aren't geeks, and um, uh, I highly recommend that. Um, yeah, and I'd be happy to talk about that, you know, um, after the talk is over. If anybody wants ideas on, on how to reach different audiences, I'm, you know, as I said, I don't feel like I ever clinched it, um, and especially when. The sandboxing came out for the Mac App Store, and we had to pull Text Expander. That made me rethink this whole 
mission of trying to reach the non-geeks because once you're not in the Mac App Store, that's going to be a, um, a, a tough uh, hill to climb to reach the people who um, don't normally download third-party software. Um, I think we have time for one more question if anybody has uh, got something on their mind, a question or a comment. Uh, Peter. Not a question so much as a comment. Um, it's talk was really interesting for me, Gene, because um, we did a, a lab yesterday, um, uh, pitch a journalist lab, and a lot of the same stuff came over when it comes to writing a press release that um, tech journalists, you know, might pay attention to. And one thing that I would suggest to the developers in the audience who are taking Gene's comments to heart is that um, following this advice can also really help you hone what it is that you're trying to do with the technology and the tools that you're developing. So um, use it as an opportunity to sort of gain clarity for yourself about what you want this to do. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. And you know, to go back to the notion of like trying to cover all your bases and throw everything into all the bullet points and make sure nothing is left out, um, when you're trying to talk to people, you really want to want to remove as much stuff as possible with also getting your uh, um, point across. Um, and you know, tech journalists are fairly geeky people, but they're not programmers mostly either. And I don't know about you, Peter, but I don't think a lot of them know what race condition is either, unless uh, they went and Googled it. <laughs> Yeah, which is not what you want. He said he has to spend a lot of time Googling um, terms that are in release notes. Uh, you know, these guys get, I don't know, hundreds of press releases a day. And if they're going to have to stop and Google what's in yours, uh, the chances of you making it into the pile that gets covered goes down dramatically. Um, I guess we have time for one more question, if anybody is. Uh, and then, and then. Um, hi. Uh, great talk. Do you Thank have you. any uh, comments or experience about about the role of emotion and personality in your communications, like versus being clear and neutral? Yeah. Oh, I mean, for this kind of writing, I mean, release notes maybe don't need to have a lot of personality, but a little actually helps. I mean, for this talk, I read over hundreds of you know release notes, and some of the ones that I thought, oh, these are really engaging, while still getting the point across. I mean. A little bit of the personality of your company comes through, and that distinguishes you from uh, all the other software that's out there. Um, one thing that really helped us at Smile is we um, uh, we went ahead and hired a copywriter. So after all these years of me writing the copy and like thinking the word string, you know, didn't really bother me, um, uh, it became clear that I'm one too close to the material at this point. I'm a little bored with it, honestly. I can't think of any other ways to describe what we're doing. Um, and it's important. I mean, your website is pretty much your, your, your store, and that's where people find out about you. And so it's worth investing, I would say, in, in uh, hiring a professional copywriter or at least somebody to edit your copy. Um, and what we did is we got this uh, awesome writer, Michael Cohen, who writes for uh, Tidbits and writes Take Control books. And he had written a book about Text Expander and PDF Pen. And we loved it. I read the whole pay book, you know, 100 pages, because it was fun to read. And I said, Michael, you, are you available <laughs> for a copywriting assignment? Because we need to make our, our website a little bit more fun to read. And so I think it really made a big difference. It improved a, a lot. So, so definitely think about that. Like I know it's I know budgets are tight. I know like shoestring, et cetera. I, we, we, we've been there, and um, but yes, try to try to think about uh, getting some help on your copy, and especially if if you're writing copy in English and English is not your native language. I know like you guys are really really good at speaking English, but there's definitely. Uh, there's something in that writing that gives away that you are not a native speaker. And it can be the tiniest thing. That you, it's not a big deal. But it, again, when you're trying to get the attention of people who um, are, have many, many uh, other developers trying to reach them, little things you know, will put people off. And, and 
you don't mean it that you don't, you know, but it's details and, and it doesn't show quite the attention to detail. So I'll just throw that out there as well. Um, so I think we're, we're uh, out of time, but I will be around and I will also, um, uh, you know, be hanging out at Jillian's later as well and uh, be happy to talk to you about anything, you know, related to this. And thanks so much for your attention and for your time. Uh, communicating across the geek divide, that's a pretty, uh, pretty broad topic. I'm going to just focus on a few things um, today um, about it. But, um, you know, it can apply to a myriad of contexts. And when I get to the end, I think I'll talk a little bit about a broader thing beyond the geek divide and just the divide in general. Um, this morning when I was procrastinating and preparing for this talk, uh, I watched Mike Lee's talk from Tuesday. and. I was just so blown away. If you haven't watched it, I'm sorry I couldn't be here when he gave it. Um, anyway, that, uh, that notion of, of trying to break down the barriers between uh, people who you've, you see as other than you, I think that's, a, that's probably one of the most important themes of this AltConf, um, and I'm really, really happy to have been part of it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, most of my professional life, I have been in this, like, cusp of the geek divide. So uh, in 2001, I participated in this fantastic program called Geek Corps. It's kind of a Peace Corps for geeks. And um, I taught web design in Ghana. Um, I lived in a house with the seven other members of Geek Corps, all guys, um, all programmers. And man, some of those dinner time discussions, I definitely felt like, wow, well, everybody's speaking a language that I don't understand. But it was cool. And uh, I learned a lot. Um, getting to know those guys and to be able to, you know, to, to communicate with them. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And um, unfortunately, the program doesn't really exist anymore like, as it did in its original form. I would be telling everybody, go sign up for it because it was awesome. Um, uh, after that, I was also a uh, web design instructor at the Pacific Northwest College of Art. And on that side, I was the geek telling the students, most of my students were print designers, and they were Our next speaker is the founder of App Camp for Girls. Uh, she's previously responsible for marketing at Smile. She volunteers at Rock and Roll Camp for Girls uh, in Portland, and she plays guitar for Ruby Calling. Jean McDonald. How's everybody doing today? Still awake? Day four? <laughs> um, I'm Jean McDonald, um, and uh, today I want to talk about this subject, which is really near and dear to my heart. For like moving into the scary world of digital uh, media, and I insisted that they had to learn HTML and uh, JavaScript uh, to be competent designers in this field, and um, definitely learning how to communicate that and make them excited about it. That was a good experience as well. Um, Smile, of course, I think a lot of you are familiar with them, and my uh, uh, Partners, my um, erstwhile partners, they were um, Philip and Greg. They're just incredible programmers and decades of experience. And I learned a lot um, with them, working together with them to help bridge that divide between smile, very geeky,
people to customers who want to use PDF Pen and Text Expander who don't, you don't need to be a geek to, to use or to want to use those programs. And finally, App Camp for Girls, that's another divide. Not really going to talk about that today. I think we've, uh, we've um, had a lot on that subject um, 